Pike, and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled Introduction to Cultural Studies. Uh, so today we'll begin with a new text. Uh, it's more of a rehearsal of something we've already done. And this particular book that we'll be studying selectively is called Critical Practice, written by Catherine Bell C. Now, what this book will enable us to do is to sort of rehearse some of the things which we have covered in terms of looking at ideology, common sense, realism, etc. So these are topics which, if you remember, we have covered already, but it's still important to go back and sort of look up at these things uh, more extensively and also perhaps uh, taking up an example of a literary text uh, in terms of seeing how these practices are employed uh, and how to deconstruct uh, these issues that is realism, uh, you know, totality, uh, common sense, etc. So what this particular book does very well, I think, Critical Practice by Catherine Bell C is that it offers you some very fresh insights in terms of looking at how realism is constructed as a totalitarian narrative strategy uh, in terms of describing and totalizing certain things, uh, you know, totalizing representational uh, politics, etc. And also how realism works uh, fantastically well in certain genres of literature. And uh, very interestingly, this book covers uh, the section on Sherlock Holmes by Conan Doyle, Arthur Conan Doyle, a very popular literature, very popular fiction, detective fiction, as you all know. And it sort of looks at how realism is employed in Sherlock Holmes. So the question of realism and the question of gender uh, come in very, very uh, interestingly. They sort of uh, looked at it as a complex uh, in this particular book by Catherine Bell C. And also what this examination of realism does is that it gives us a very good example of how to deconstruct realism, how to look at um, things such as ideology, realism, totalitarianism, uh, totalitarian narrative strategies, etc., in terms of looking at it from a deconstructionist uh, perspective. So, Critical Practice by uh, Catherine Belsey is a very useful book for us in cultural studies, not least because uh, it deals with some of the most salient issues that we have been covering and talking about since the very inception of this course. So, the coming two lectures will be spent almost entirely uh, looking at Belsey's book, uh, Critical Practice. It's one of those, um, it's one of the classics. Uh, uh, you know, one might say in, in cultural studies today. So, you know, as the very title suggests, uh, critical practice is basically looking at the proxy of uh, criticism, the proxy, the practical application uh, of cultural studies, the practical application of critical theory, etc. And it takes a really rich range, a really rich historical range from, uh, you know, uh, structuralism to post structuralism, uh, semiotics, etc., and, and looks at how. Uh, these things are employed, these things are sort of a part of the coded mechanism of culture, part of the coded narratives of culture. And obviously, if you are examining uh, narratives as coded narratives, what you're essentially doing is that you're decoding those narratives uh, from a deconstructionist uh, point of view. So, Belsey's uh, Critical Practice is a very, very important book for us in cultural studies today, you know, because it talks about what is popular, what is literary, and how the popular literary, so all these things are entangled in terms of looking at uh, how culture is constructed and colluded and becomes uh, a complex of different kinds of collusions. Now, there's a very interesting section uh, called opacity in this book. And uh, as you know, opacity is the opposite of transparency. So opacity is something that you can't see through. Uh, opacity is that kind of a, uh, a condition which uh, sort of restricts if you restricts your you know, understanding uh, to a certain extent of certain things. So what this section is essentially, uh, it looks it looks at opacity as an ontology. So it's an ontological examination of opacity or an examination of the ontology of opacity, whichever way you want to see it. Uh, but also what it does is something very, very important in terms of how it looks at the opacity of language and culture studies, opacity of language and critical theory. Because this one of the most common accusations against critical theory, one of the most common accusations of the vocabulary of culture studies, that is, it's very opaque, it's difficult to understand. Uh, so if you read uh, essays by Derrida, if you read essays by you know, Homi Bhabha, uh, you know, Gatri Spivak, you find that oftentimes you, you find it a bit frustrating in terms of looking at uh, you know, the, the meaning, understanding the meaning of the language. And the language seems to be quite dense and uh, condensed as well. And now what Belsey is doing in this section, she's offering not an apology but an explanation uh, for this opacity. So she looks at opacity as a very necessary ontological condition, a necessary linguistic condition. Uh, if you are to subvert uh, the tyranny of realism, and I use the word phrase quite deliberately, the tyranny of realism. So realism as a strategy, as an narrative strategy, that, that is a grand narrative as a norm, 
of representational techniques. So, you know, any classic realist text becomes by default choice uh, of representation. So, it has a linearity of representation, uh, a temporal linearity, a spatial li uh, linearity, uh, a sequential linearity. So, realism uh, as a device, as an narrative device, it aims towards a totalitarian uh, form of representation and it's enormously successful, as you all know. It's one of the biggest grand narratives, it's one of the most successful, one of the most surreptitious uh, grand narratives around realism. So quickly, realism uh, colludes with patriarchy, you know, it, it, it colludes all kinds of other grand narratives. So realism becomes the default favorite uh, in terms of representing any grand narrative. So Belsi's argument in the section is, if we are to subvert realism, if we are to subvert the tyranny of realism, uh, the best bet uh, for us is to write in a different kind of language, a defamiliarized language. And again, the word defamiliarization is a very, is a very important word in literary studies because you know, one can trace it back uh, to a school of criticism called formalism, uh, started, you know, was started by a few Russian uh, critics including Viktor Shlovsky, uh, who was the, perhaps the founding figure uh, in that uh, particular school. So defamiliarization was a way of looking at language differently, was to redesign language. Uh, change the uh, coordinates of combination in, in language and thereby uh, offering a fresh perspective, offering a new kind of s semantic possibility, uh, generating uh, new semantic possibilities out of language, out of linguistic uh, structures. So opacity, uh, according to Belsi in this, uh, in this very compelling and convincing argument, I think, uh, is not really a lack, it's not really um, a, you know, a condition which makes language deliberate or difficult, etc. It's a form of representation which is aimed, which is designed to subvert, uh, you know, the seemingly, the seeming seamlessness of realism. Uh, and I use the word seeming seamlessness quite deliberately because, you know, like all grand narratives, realism too operates best when it appears, when it manages to efface its constructed quality, when you don't realize that it is actually a constructed quality, it's a, actually a constructed category. You assume it uh, you consume it as a given, you consume it as something which is uh, always there, right? And it's always there, a condition of realism, something which is deconstructed, which is interrupted by the opacity of representation. And hence, opacity becomes a very important category of representation in uh, critical studies. And so, this is a very important section because, like Foucault's What is, what is an Author, uh, this too is a very good example of discourse analysis. And you know, it's very, like I said, as students of uh, you know, uh, literary criticism as students of critical theory, as students of cultural studies, we are often asked about this opacity of language. We are often asked why is this so difficult to understand? Why is this language, uh, you know, so so unfamiliar, so defamiliarized? So over here, Belsi is offering an intellectual explanation for this, an ontological explanation for this, for this difficulty in um, you know the, the kind of language written in culture studies and critical theory. And you know, this is a very very noble. Uh, not noble, very elegant explanation, I think, offered by Belsi in this particular section. So let's read it in details and then we an analyze it as best we can. Uh, partly as a consequence of this theory, the language used by its practitioners is usually far from transparent. So uh, you know, immediately the language is, so is described as being situated opposite of transparency. It's not something which uh, you know, produces meanings very, very easily. It's not really a meaning producing machine, this language, but rather it's kind of language which will uh, constantly subvert and frustrate uh, any seamless uh, sort of fishing for meanings. So meanings become secondary away up. The effect of this is to alert the reader to the opacity of language and to avoid the tyranny of lucidity, the impression that what is being said must be true simply because it's clear and familiar. Now, this and all the adjectives in this particular section are very, very uh, loaded adjectives. So, true, clear, and familiar. So, these are often conjoined together. So, we oftentimes consume the fact that, you know, we assume and consume the, the, the belief that what is uh, familiar and what is clear must be necessarily true, right? So, this equation between truth and familiarity, between truth and clarity, uh, is a very, very important condition for realism to work. Uh, to realism to operate and this operative principle of realism sort of relies to a large extent on this very easy and unproblematic equation between clarity and truth, uh, between uh, lucidity and truth, between familiarity and truth. And that is something that is attacked, that is something which is subverted and questioned by Belsi Wayam. And as she 
she says also that the best way to question this easy equation, this unproblematic equation, is to draw attention to the fact that language is opaque uh, or to foreground the opacity of language um, in critical theory and cultural studies. So that's a very important, uh, a very provocative uh, opening in this particular section. Uh, so this entire tyranny of lucidity, the lucidity, the fact that it's lucid and understandable, and that becomes a tyranny because just because it's understandable, uh, we oftentimes extend it to the realm of truth. Uh, we oftentimes naturally assume it to be uh, true, assume it to be the correct the version, uh, because we can understand that we, we are familiar with this. The, the coordinates are familiar to us. And that is an error of judgment uh, according to Belsey. And so what this opacity of language does is that it draws the attention and highlights the attention quite deliberately to the constructed quality of language, to the manufactured quality of language, which makes us more uh, frustrated in terms of understanding the meanings out of it. So the modes of address of post-Sazorian writers such as Lou Althusser, Rolla Barth, Jacques Derrida and Jacques Lacan, although different from each other in important ways, share this property of difficulty and not simply from a perverse desire to be obscure. Right? So it's not really a desire to be obscure, it's not really uh, uh, you know, getting a fun out of being obscure. Uh, that is driving this kind of language, but rather, uh, you know, this property of difficulty is something which is, uh, you know, uh, deliberately designed by writers of the post Caesarian tradition. So, by post Caesarian, uh, one could also say post modern or post structuralist, more specifically. So, people like Althusser, Barth, Derrida, and Lacan, although they work in very different realms, they are very different kinds of philosophers. Uh, some more linguistic, some more psychological, but their representations uh, are quite familiar, quite similar in terms of their uh, deliberate difficulty. And this is not really, it should not be seen as a perverse desire to be obscure, as something which is deliberate uh, in terms of being obscure, in terms of being, um, you know, outside of meanings. But, but this difficulty is actually a very deliberate design, a very deliberate combination, which is supposed to highlight the opacity of language. So language as an opaque construct, language as an opaque ontology. That is something which is highlighted uh, in this difficulty, uh, which is um, you know, palpably present in the writings of these writers, these thinkers. Okay, to challenge familiar assumptions and familiar values in the vocabulary, which in order to be easily readable, is compelled to reproduce these assumptions and values, uh, you know, is an impossibility. New concepts, new theories necessitate new, unfamiliar, and therefore initially difficult terms. So, uh, if we are to challenge familiar assumptions, if we are to challenge the normative categories of knowledge, of representation, of uh, existence, etc., there is almost imperative that we do so in a language which is, which is new and unfamiliar, according to Belsey, and its newness or the unfamiliarity is part of the opacity package, part of the difficulty package. So it will appear, appear difficult initially, and its initial difficulty is, uh, is an important step, is an important uh, uh, temporal uh, condition. So, you know, the word initially is also important over here. So, when a fresh perspective, when an avant garde art technique, uh, when a new kind of modality of representation is uh, first comes into being, uh, then obviously, um, you know, what is highlighted is the newness and the unfamiliarity of it. And so, the unfamiliarity becomes a part of the new package, part of the subversive package. So, the, the subversion. Uh, comes along with the newness, comes along with the defamiliarization. So we have a new kind of equation at hand over here, subversion and defamiliarization. Uh, and both are aimed towards dissolving the normative categories of narrative, the normative categories of knowledge, etc. So new concepts, new theories, necessitate new, unfamiliar and therefore initially difficult terms. For instance, I shall introduce the word ideology in a way which may be unfamiliar associating it with common sense rather than with a set of doctrines or a coherent system of beliefs. So, ideology as we know by now uh, is one of the most heavily used terms in cultural studies and critical theory. Now, what Belsey does over here is that she draws attention to the banality of the word ideology. So, it's not really uh, always a very, very subversive, uh, a very avant-garde, a very grand intellectual kind of a word. So, ideology is something that's operated in the most banal conditions. Uh, even in the most mundane conditions. So, drawing attention to the word ideology and making it opaque uh, is something which should be uh, part of the deconstructionist process in, in critical theory if we are to deconstruct ideology, if we are to deconstruct and debunk the myth of ideology, then the word ideology should be used in all kinds of conditions, not just in intellectual academic parlance, but also uh, equally and perhaps more importantly, 
uh, in very, very mundane, very, very you know, daily conditions of life. So you know, this is a bit of a funny example, but if you go to YouTube, you find there's a, there's a video by Slavoj Žižek, who's an ex-author, who's an ex-writer, will take up after the completion of this book, where Žižek talks about how ideology is operative even when you are doing something as you know, visceral and so doing something so mundane as you know, going to a toilet. So even if you're going inside a toilet, the way the toilet seats are constructed, uh, they are quite interestingly reflective of certain ideological constructs, certain ideological affiliations. So it talks about the difference in the toilet seats, the design of toilet seats, if you are to go to France or in Germany or in England. And that has some kind of a interesting reflection uh, on certain uh, ideological affiliations and ideological uh, narratives uh, at work. So what Zizek says in that video, and it's very popular, you can look it up on YouTube, uh, where he says quite clearly that, you know, ideology is not just when you're reading books, when you're giving a seminar paper, or when you're doing racial profiling. Uh, ideology takes place even when you're doing something as mundane as going to a toilet and relieving yourself. Uh, the design of a toilet is also reflective of a certain kind of ideology, and that, that being reflective of that, that kind of ideology, you know, hammers home the point, the ideology is operative almost everywhere. It's operative in the way we think, the way we eat, dress, behave, socialize, etc. So even uh, you know, some very, very unconscious activities, activities we're not conscious of, that we just do it naturally, uh, is oftentimes a product or epiphenomenon of an internalization of ideology. So it's just an example of uh, perfect uh, internalization or clinically complete internalization that we don't question. Um, the presence of ideology in certain conditions, we just consume it, we just take it for granted as uh, something that's already there, uh, you know, unquestionably. Okay, so the word ideology is used by Belsi in a very similar kind of way and you know, she is uh, trying to talk about how, you know, if you make the word opaque, if we draw attention to the word uh, ideology, then obviously we will stop taking for granted then the entire transparency and the easy uh, internalization that comes with transparency and familiarity will be interrupted. So in other words, what opacity does is that it brings out a very interesting interruption in meaning production and meaning consumption. Uh, so the way we consume meaning, the way we process meaning is interrupted when we come by opacity of language, when you know, opacity becomes a condition of language in terms of how uh, words are designed, how language is constructed, how language is you know, combined and permuted, etc. So opacity becomes a part of the interruption mechanism, which is of course part of the um, you know, deconstructionist mechanism because then it opens up uh, to plural possibilities of meaning rather than have a monolineal uh, kind of a meaning production whereby we use and produce meanings in a very uh, familiar and cliched kind of a way. So uh, opacity is defamiliarization, opacity is interruption, and this interruption becomes a necessary condition in cultural studies, especially if we are interested in subversion uh, through deconstruction. So, you know, this is what uh, Belsi talks about when she says, when she describes and mentions ideology as an example of this. So, for instance, I shall introduce the word ideology in a way which may become, which may be unfamiliar, associating it with common sense rather than with a set of doctrines or a coherent system of beliefs. So common sense becomes a very important category in Belsi's analysis and we find she spends a lot of time talking about common sense, how common sense can become a tyranny, how common sense can become a granulative in its own right. Uh, and so this easy consumption of common sense, uh, the easy subscription to common sense becomes also uh, a form of indoctrination to a grand narrative. So common sense, what is common sense? Common sense is basically a practical wisdom, uh, the most convenient form of knowledge production and knowledge consumption. Uh, and if you're inside that particular normative network of knowledge, which is common sense, then uh, obviously you're part of the indoctrination process. You are, you know, indoctrinated, you are interpolated uh, into that uh, ideology of common sense. But suppose you step out of it, you do something which is absurd, uh, that can sometimes become subversive in quality when you know you step out of the map of common sense, the landscape of common sense, and enact a subversive act, uh, enact a subversive you know, iteration. You inscribe something, you um, you know you iterate something, you cite something, which becomes subversive in quality. And we saw that in Butler as well. If you remember that you know, when Butler talks about the drag, uh, she mentions quite clearly that how the drag becomes uh, anti-common sense and how gender is part of the common sense mechanism of 
identity production, how it's a very binaristic, dualistic uh, kind of identity production where, you know, where the most gr the, the granulative is compulsory heterosexuality, which then becomes part of the common sense package. Uh, but common sense to Belsi is obviously a construct like realism, um, you know, like so many other d different kinds of granulatives, and we just consume the construct, uh, we internalize the construct uh, without questioning it, without questioning its constructed quality. And that becomes a very important uh, tool in critical studies to question the constructed quality, to unpack uh, or experience the constructed quality of any grand relative, including common sense and realism. So, ideology uh, operates, uh, you know, as associated with common sense, and this association with common sense is something with that, that Belsi is interested in, and it's something Belsi is unpacking and highlighting in this particular section. So, my use of the term derived from Althusser assumes that ideology is not an optional extra, deliberately adopted by self-conscious individuals, conservative party ideology for example, for instance. But the very condition of our experience of the world, unconsciously, precisely, unconscious precisely, uh, in that it is unquestioned, taken for granted. So, again, it's taken for granted status of ideology is something that Annabelle is highlighting over here. And uh, she says quite clearly, it's not, ideology is not really something out there, something which is extra, something which is a bit of an embellishment. It's almost a biological organic uh, form of consumption, a biological organic form of um, appropriation, you know, internalization, that we just do it uh, as part of a condition of our experience of the world. And it's an unconscious internalization, an unconscious uh, process of subscription, whereby we just take it for granted without questioning. Uh, so, ideology in Althusser's use of the term works in conjunction with political practice and economy practice to constitute the social formation, a term designed to promote a more complex and radical analysis than a familiar term society, which often evokes either a single homogeneous mass or alternatively a loosely connected group of autonomous individuals and thus offers no challenge to the assumptions of common sense. So, according to Althusser, and obviously Belsi is drawing on Althusser quite heavily over here, uh, ideology and common sense, they become very important instruments of, you know, uh, instruments of consensus, which is uh, you know, imperative towards any kind of, um, you know, social formation. Uh, so, social formation becomes a more complex category uh, than society because that's how, you know, certain communities are formed and communities are formed through certain kinds of consensus. Uh, which are ideologically determined, which are ideologically governed. So, ideology and common sense, far from being uh, intellectual extra, far from being intellectual embellishments, are uh, in very vital processes, very vital components of our existence as societies, as individuals in society, uh, uh, to the extent uh, to which we, we, we subscribe to those uh, ideologies and common sense, or commonsensical ideologies, one might say. So, the extent of our internalization, the extent of our subscription, uh, the extent of our conformity or confirmation to those ideological common sense or common sensical ideology uh, determines our location in a particular community. Uh, so, our location of identity, the, you know, the location of our particular individuality is dependent or sort of rather one must say is overdetermined or overdetermined by our subscription and internalization of that particular ideology in that particular point of time. Now, it's important to understand, it's important to add that any ideology is context sensitive, uh, any form of dominant discourse is context sensitive and you know the dominance and the discursive quality, uh, they change along with the time. So, the, when the material coordinates change, when the economic coordinates change, when the discursive coordinates change, then the ideological flair, the ideological color, the ideological narrative also changes and you know again we are back to this very old uh, theory that we have been talking about since the beginning of the course and that is this uh, constant uh, uh, interplay between the inside and the outside, this constant dialogue between the inside and the outside. Uh, the brain and society, the brain, the inside that is you as an individual, the inward looking person and uh, the person located in a particular in a material condition. So, the inside outside loop uh, is highlighted here as well. So, ideology becomes not just a discursive uh, activity, but also to a certain extent a biological activity, I mean depending on the extent of internalization. So, if one internalizes it perfectly, then it becomes almost biological to the extent that it is unconscious. You know, you do not realize that you are an ideologically overdetermined creature uh, performing uh, various micro acts of conformity uh, in a particular society. Okay. So, and then Belsi goes on to say quite clearly that ideology is inscribed in language in the sense that it is literally written or spoken in it. So, language is ideological as we all know.
uh, it's deeply illogical. So you know, it's almost impossible to talk about language without its illogical affiliations, without its illogical subscriptions, without its discursive subscriptions. So no language is ideology free. No language is uh, you know, discourse free or meta discursive. So any form of language, any form of representation is illogical by default. Uh, whether in, in terms of its conformity to a particular ideology or in terms of its subversion of that particular ideology. So rather than a separate element which exists independently in some free floating realm of ideas uh, and subsequently embodied in words, ideology is a way of thinking, speaking, experiencing. Uh, this is a beautiful description, uh, especially the, the last word experiencing. So ideology becomes an experience. Uh, you know, so there's an experiential quality of ideology and, and this should remind us of Hacking's uh, magnificent mood that we study in the social construction of what, when he talks about that the, the, da the danger that if we are looking at discourses purely as constructs and not as experiences, then we end up being uh, you know just hyper constructionist uh, intellectuals who are totally cut off from the reality of ideology, from the reality of discourses. So it's important for us to understand the experiential component of discourses and ideologies as, as well, rather than just the, the constructed categories of knowledge. So ideology, discourses, so these become uh, experiential as well as discursive and a very asymmetric entanglement. Again, one of my pet phrases which I've been using and throwing at you essentially since the very inception of the discourse, but it's a handy phrase, I'm sure you'll agree. And that is this embeddedness of uh, language uh, and ideology is something that we must be aware of and this awareness comes only when we step out of it, only when we sort of begin to question the constructed quality uh, of language itself. Okay, so uh, so this is something that you know, Belsey is very, very uh, keen to highlight, very, very keen to sort of communicate to us. So language is not really a free floating realm of ideas at all, but rather language is a way of thinking, speaking, and experiencing. So language becomes an experience, so ideology becomes an experience. So your entire ideological formation, your entire ideological affiliation becomes an experiential category, not just a intellectual category. Okay, so the danger is that the unfamiliar vocabularies render the new theories inaccessible or not worth the effort of learning to understand them. Uh, learning theory is like much like learning a language. And of course, uh, and of course the last resort of common sense is to dismiss as unnecessary jargon, any vocabulary which conflicts with its own. This is an effortless way of evading conceptual challenges, of course, and eliciting reassuring sneers, but it negates the repeated liberal humanist claim to open-mindedness and pluralism. Of course, jargon exists, but from a perspective in which ideology is held to be inscribed in language, so that no linguistic forms are ideologically innocent or neutral. It follows that terms cannot be seen as unnecessary simply on a basis that they are new. To resist all linguistic innovation is by implication to claim that we already know all we need to know. So what Bells is saying over here is the dogma uh, of common sense, the dogma of uh, the totalitarian common sense which appears to know everything. And so the jargon of literary theory, the jargon of um, you know, uh, this kind of new language, it is a new language and that is oftentimes dismissed uh, from the perspective of common sense, saying it's not really commonsensical at all, it doesn't make sense uh, from a commonsensical perspective. And this dismissal, according to Belsey, is a very discursive dismissal because what this dismissal ensures is that there's no uh, subversion to common sense, there's no subversion to this ideologically uh, you know, dogmatic language which appears to be non-ideological. Now this new language is overtly ideological, this new language is overtly discursive and in that overt discursivity and its overtly ideological quality it appears to be opaque. So the opacity is part of the overtness, right? Uh, but what that does, this opacity and overtness, what it does is that it highlights how language is always uh, discursive in quality, language is always ideological in quality. Uh, you know, there's this quality which is hidden by common sense, hidden by realism, etc. So obviously uh, you know, it takes some rocket scientists to believe, to understand that how this kind of new language, this kind of new theoretical language would be anathema uh, to common sense, a common sensical ideological formation. And so uh, the, you know, the, the very convenient attack against these languages would be to say that they are non-common sensical in quality. But that is precisely the point because they are directed against common sense, they are designed uh, to be directed against common sense. So as you can see, uh, Belsi says quite clearly that no language and no linguistic forms are illogically innocent or neutral. So we cannot really have a, 
a, a neutral ideological kind of language so, or an ideology free language as I just said. Uh, every activity in language, every activity in representation is an ideological activity, is a discursive activity. And what Belsia just highlighted before, and that is this discursivity or this ideological quality, is not just um, a socially constructed text, it's also a real experience, it's also a phenomenal experience, it's something which you experience with our bodies, with our brains, with the systems, with the nervous systems. And that's something which is, uh, you know, which should be kept in mind. This constant entanglement between experientiality and textuality is not really just a text. Uh, or neither is it just an experience, but it's a very important combination of experientiality and textuality. And that's something that uh, Hacking at uh, wonders, Hacking at very highlighted very, very uh, judiciously, I think. And that's something that uh, Belsi seems to be saying here as well. So with that, we conclude the opening section. We conclude the opening lecture on Catherine Belsi's uh, critical practice. And hopefully, we'll have one more lecture after this. We'll be finished with this text, and then we move on to the final text of our course, one we've been waiting for a long time to come to you, and that is Slava Zizek's uh, Welcome to the Desert of the Real. But for now, we end with Catherine Belsi's opening lecture on critical practice, and we have one more lecture on this book in the next session. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>